I'm talking today with Nicholas Hollis, who runs the General Longstreet Recognition Project. The Recognition Project is an initiative of the Agribusiness Council's Heritage Preservation Committee. The Agribusiness Council is an educational nonprofit organization founded in 1967. Hollis asserts that Longstreet's contributions to American history have been overlooked for many years. Nick will focus today on the friendship between James Longstreet and Ulysses S. Grant, which began during their years at West Point and was interrupted by the war and was resumed during the remainder of Grant's life. Longstreet outlived Grant by about 20 years, and Nick will have some things to say about how Longstreet's activities in that post-Grant era affected both of their reputations. Uh, Nick, how did your interest in the Grant-Longstreet relationship develop? Well, Eric, I've been a, a student of history for uh, a long time, and I've been very interested in military history as a, um, a, a subject. Grant has always been uh, appealing, and, and uh, Longstreet himself has also been appealing. Uh, I did a lot of work on Longstreet in the 90s, and I discovered that there were a, a series of intersections that were both mysterious and intriguing with respect to Longstreet and Grant that uh, required more study. And I've been applying that as a, as a hobby, really, uh, ever since. Good. Could you describe their relationship? Tell us briefly about how they met. Well, you mentioned uh, in the intro that, that uh, Grant and Longstreet uh, first met at, at West Point as uh, young cadets. Grant actually was a year behind Longstreet. Longstreet was there when Grant arrived as a plebe. Um, but their relationship um, blossomed at, um, at West Point. Strange relationship in a way because Grant was a very diminutive personage when he arrived. He was only 5'1 and 117 pounds. And Longstreet was the strapping 6'2, muscular, athletic, arguably with his cadet friends, the best looking cadet at the point one of the biggest cadets that ever hit the point. So um, Grant and Longstreet formed an interesting uh, bond, let's put it that way, uh, at the point, and it f flowered on as they, as they grew as men. Well, Nick, what makes their relationship important to us now, 150 years later? Well, this, this is part of an inquiry when you ask, you know, the, the, why is their relationship important? Historians often scoff at people that try to look into relationships or um, anything to do with this type of uh, uh, second guessing sort of as to what really happened between two people that are long gone. But uh, Grant and Longstreet are American giants. Grant certainly, uh, as the 18th president of the United States, uh, deserves a great deal of, of interest, especially now that we're in the sesquicentennial 150th anniversary of the, of the war itself. Um, but both uh, as American warriors, Grant and Longstreet, um, deserve our attention and I think are getting it uh, increasingly but people don't realize the relationship between the two and how that uh, that affected them and how it affected the war and how it affected the reconstruction period after the war and indeed the whole sweep of American history from uh, when they first met all the way out to when finally uh, Longstreet uh, passed away in 1904 so it's it it pres provides a kind of an interesting uh, look at intersections of not only their lives, but history ac across that span of decades that, that as a hobby, has become uh, my, my passion, really. Well, I'd like to pick up on that a little bit and ask you how you'd amplify this relationship, the Grant-Longstreet relationship, in, in a much broader discussion. Well, I'd amplify it by, by focusing on the intersections between Grant and Longstreet. And, uh, how uh, not, not just at the point, what kinds of things brought them together. For example, their love of horses and the fact that um, Grant was uh, one of the, the greatest equestrian um, um, cadets that ever graduated from the point. His, his uh, skills and his, uh, his feats were legendary um, and they continued on, of course, during his life. But uh, Grant and Longstreet had that love of horses um, they came from very different backgrounds. Grant was from a humble uh, southern Ohio background, a rural a small town, Georgetown, Ohio, along the Ohio River. And uh, Longstreet was from a, a fairly aristocratic uh, Georgian um, 
uh, background in northern Georgia, but he was as comfortable in the backwoods hunting and riding as he was in drawing rooms arguing politics. Um, they were very different, but uh, the fact that they, uh, they came together and they uh, stayed together, really. After, after they graduated from West Point, they went to Jefferson Barracks, uh, posting outside of St. Louis. And at Jefferson Barracks, uh, Grant, uh, joining Longstreet once again a year after Longstreet got there, found that Longstreet had a variety of social connections. And uh, Grant was shy and Grant was uh, interested in having the Southern uh, mentor Longstreet help him with the social side of his life. And, and uh, Longstreet did that. Uh, the two of them rode, in fact, to a nearby uh, uh, plantation where one of Longstreet's uh, cousins lived. Um, and that cousin, Julia Dent, and her, her father, Colonel Dent, uh, became um, an important part of Grant's social life, and Grant courted Julia Dent at Longstreet's introduction. And then when they finally, after the Mexican War, got married, it was Longstreet who was Grant's best man, his groomsman. And um, I think that as you go forward from those known relationships, uh, although that question about whether just what relationship Grant had and uh, or what relationship Longstreet had at Grant's wedding uh, is uh, arguable. His latest biographer um, claims that he was the best man, in fact. Um, when you go into the, the focus of, of um, other intersections, be they the Mexican War that both young uh, officers learned from or their sweep into the West after the war and manifest destiny being posted at strange places across the American West, to Grant's own decision to leave the Army because of the distances and the loneliness he experienced out in California, um, the stress on military families is often talked about today, um, the fact that they continued to um, uh, correspond through their wives, that were, their wives were best friends, um, and that they be tr treated each other as kin, really, uh, kind of in a silent, between the lines relationship that uh, transcended the war in many ways. And I would talk about um, not just the war and the obvious battles and the interaction as they both rose into prominence in their respective armies, but also what happened uh, after the war uh, in the Reconstruction era and the importance that Grant placed on Longstreet and his role in Grant's reconstruction plans. And then uh, in the final end game of their lives, how after Grant's heroics at Mount McGregor and his efforts to um, restore his family's financial uh, strength, uh, Longstreet uh, continued to, uh, for 20 years really, at reunions, primarily in the North, because Longstreet by this time had become uh, almost a pariah in the South. Um, by supporting Grant and Reconstruction, that Longstreet became uh, one of Grant's greatest cheerleaders and one of the people that people would come to listen at these reunions to a credible, uh, high-ranking uh, soldier talking about their mystery man, Ulysses S. Grant. Northerners wanted to know everything they could about Grant after he passed away. They wanted to know if he, how he became so famous and how he became such a, uh, a legend and Longstreet never disappointed him. He told him stories from their childhood, their, their, their youth back at the point. He told him stories about the Grant's exploits in the Mexican War and I'd revisit some of those um, stories uh, to demonstrate that this was a terribly important relationship and I, lest I forget, the very important uh, position that uh, the friendship assumed during the critical uh, hours after Lee and Grant had decided to, or Lee had come to Grant to surrender at Appomattox. People don't realize that just behind the scenes in those critical moments of discussion and uh, capitulation, that it was trust and belief that Lee had in Longstreet that led Lee to agree to go to see Grant and to seek surrender, believing that, as Longstreet told him, Grant would be magnanimous. And that trust and the fact that when Lee and Grant did sit down, 
Grant treated Lee exactly as Longstreet told Lee he would. That led to a very important series of, of uh, steps. Longstreet was appointed by Lee to be the head of the, the commission that worked out the details of the surrender. People don't know that. They don't know how Grant treated Longstreet when he walked into the McLean house after the surrender and the enormity of the, of the friendship once again surfacing to the shock of all the Union officers in attendance that uh, then permeated the, the, uh, the next couple of days, critical days in our, our republic because the spirit of Grant's magnanim magnanimous generosity and um, almost humbleness in the, in, the, in, the, in the victory was uh, enabled the country to begin to work back to the terribly, desperately treacherous uh, path toward getting together again and the Reconstruction era, although almost snuffed out by an assassin's bullet in Washington a few days later, still uh, provided an enormous uh, uh, opportunity that was seized upon by Grant as soon as he took power himself as president. But there's, you know, there's a lot of different sides of the story and how, how uh, especially in the Reconstruction era, the two men worked together. That has not been uh, brought out. Well, during the war, when Grant and Longstreet were not close associates or friends, did they ever face each other in battle? And if they did, which, which ones and what were the outcomes? Well, you know, Grant, Grant uh, rose um, through his uh, amazing efforts at coordination and logistics and uh, just sheer skill in the West while Longstreet uh, labored in the command of the Army of Northern Virginia in the East. And... Um, Although Longstreet wanted to, uh, to gain independent command, and he even, in fact, wanted to move to the Western Front. Um, after Lee became the commanding general of the Army of Northern Virginia, Longstreet worked in hand in glove with, with uh, Lee and became his number, number one lieutenant general, running the first corps of the Army of Northern Virginia. Grant's uh, arrival uh, as finally Lincoln's general that he could win with and that Lincoln couldn't do without came as a result of a series of brilliant victories along the Tennessee and Cumberland Rivers and finally the, the success at uh, Vicksburg. And when Grant finally assumed um, the, uh, the control of the, the uh, command of the entire Union Army in the, in the early spring of 1864, um, the only battle they actually faced off against each other in was the Battle of the Wilderness in May, early May of 1864. It was a close encounter at, at, uh, at Chattanooga, but actually Longstreet's Corps was pulled out of Chattanooga uh, by Jefferson Davis to attack Knoxville. So he never faced Grant and Sherman in the West. But in, um, in Wilderness, in the Battle of Wilderness in early May of 1864, uh, Longstreet's corps was positioned out in the um, Shenandoah Valley, really, near Gordonsville. And Lee and the other corps, uh, two corps, were in the wilderness dense forests outside of uh, Fredericksburg. And when Grant began moving across the Rapidan on uh, May the 4th, 1864, um, inexplicably he didn't call Longstreet, didn't let him know that he, to join the army until very late. Longstreet's corps marched 35 to 40 miles in a space of under 40 hours. And just as they arrived on the battlefield on the morning, very early morning of May 6th, the Union Army was crushing the, um, the uh, AP Hill Corps on, the, on the, um, the left flank of the Confederate Army. And uh, it would have been all over in a matter of uh, minutes. Um, Grant had ordered, ironically, an attack to begin at 4.30 in the morning on May the 6th. Had the attack begun on time, uh, it's unlikely that Hill's Corps would have survived. And indeed, the whole then Federal, the federal Army would have crushed the, the, uh, the uh, Army of Northern Virginia. But Grant um, had, had asked Meade to, to, to take the attack on at 4.30, and Meade had pleaded that he needed another at least a half an hour to an hour to get Burnside's corps into position. And uh, Grant reluctantly gave me the extra time. That extra time allowed, uh, as it happened, 
Longstreet's Corps running the last five miles to the battlefield and arriving just as Hill's people were pulling out and fleeing. The ability to discipline um, set up and march into battle and hold Hancock and his corps and then by about eight o'clock in the morning stabilize the situation and then um, holding out three brigades. Longstreet was very prescient in the old flank attack idea. He knew or found out that there was an, un, there was an unfinished railroad trace deep in the woods sweeping off the flank of Hancock's advance and uh, he positioned these three brigades in that unfinished railroad trace and at 11 o'clock in the morning the signal was given and the howling rebels came out of the of the deep woods screaming and firing and hit Hancock's flank and rolled it up like a wet blanket Hancock later said and nearly uh, broke the the, uh, the whole Union Army um, and just at the moment of, of great uh, victory and, and uh, the apex of the battle Longstreet and his generals are riding up Orange Plank Road and again there's a fire from friendly fire that hits Longstreet in the neck and nearly kills him and the battle momentum is, is, uh, is stalled and the attack ends and um, uh, although Longstreet is not killed as Jackson had been the year before by his friendly fire um, the battle of the wilderness ends in a stalemate uh, one of the bloodiest battles in, in, the, uh, in the course of the Civil War but Grant's generals are all gathered around him and, and uh, he's whittling sticks it's late afternoon of the 6th of May and uh, Grant chides his generals and says, you know, I'm getting really tired of hearing what Robert E. Lee is going to do. To listen to you, he's going to do uh, cartwheels and jumping jacks and somersaults and land on both your flanks and your rear at the same time. If I were you, I'd go back to your commands and figure out what, we, what you're going to do. Of course, Grant by that time already knew what he was going to do and he announced his orders the next morning and the troops cheered as instead of going back to Washington as they had in pre three previous encounters with the rebel army at, uh, at around Fredericksburg. Grant pivoted off the intersection of Orange Plank Road and Brock Road and, and began rolling south toward, toward Richmond. And his men knew that Grant was a different kind of fighter. So that's the Battle of Wilderness um, and all, not all of its terrors. We could talk about more of them. It's one of the worst battles in the Civil War and it itself is not very well uh, understood or known. But it was called the Great Bushwhacking in the Woods. But that's the only intersection, a direct intersection between Grant and Longstreet yeah. and neither one had much to brag about from that, uh, that intersection. Well Longstreet did. Longstreet, that was the last great um, offensive, uh, counter-offensive or offensive move that the Army of Northern Virginia was able to perform during the war. After that it was all defensive. So the last great sweep of rebel yell uh, brigades coming through the woods and succeeding and driving, um, although they didn't drive all the Yankees, but they drove a lot of the, of the, uh, of the core of Hancock out of the position. Um, that was Longstreet's uh, final hurrah. He was wounded badly wounded, almost died. He would have if he had been a lesser in lesser health. But he doesn't rejoin the, um, the army until uh, October when he can ride again. So it takes him months to get back on, on his saddle. And um, by that time, Grant has cornered Lee at Petersburg and it's a battle of attrition. It's a trench warfare. Longstreet is placed in, uh, in control of the defenses of Richmond and uh, indeed Longstreet and um, his wife and Julia Grant and General Ord begin exchanging peace uh, letters and dialogues to create a peace in uh, the late spring of 1865. And again, it's Julia Grant and uh, Longstreet's wife, Marie Louise Garland uh, Longstreet, who um, along with Ord and Longstreet himself, begin to create a, a dialogue for peace that people don't realize actually happened. Julia Grant in her memoirs talks about it, um, and a little bit uh, tongue-in-cheek, but a little irritated that, that Grant wouldn't let her go forward with some of the proposals um, to try to, uh, to end the, the, uh, the needless, at that point, um, bloodletting. You, you gave us a hint earlier about post-war 
relationship between Grant and Longstreet by talking about their encounter at, at Appomattox. How would you describe how the friendship changed as the war faded and uh, Grant and Longstreet assumed their post-war um, positions? Well, it, it, you remember that after the war, um, when, when Lee went to Appomattox, he actually expected to be uh, possibly arrested as a traitor. Um, after the war ended, when uh, Grant the Magnanimous was dealing with Andrew Johnson, the president who had assumed uh, the presidency after Lincoln's assassination, Johnson being from East Tennessee remembered Longstreet. And uh, although Grant pushed for an immediate pardon for Longstreet um, and Grant or and Lee and Jefferson Davis. Andrew Johnson uh, at a famous meeting in the White House with Longstreet said there are only three men that cannot be pardoned ever. You, General Lee and Jefferson Davis, you have caused us too much trouble. Grant immediately went on the offensive and as of course he was the most famous man in the country at that point. Um, he uh, lobbied hard to get a pardon for, uh, for Longstreet and succeeded in getting Longstreet's name added to a list in Congress that, that uh, were, were given their pardons in early uh, 1866. And I think that um, the position that Longstreet had at that point uh, with Grant, Grant in ascendance, Grant moving toward um, running for president himself, in 1868, um, all this uh, juxtaposition suddenly of, of the friendship, where suddenly it was Grant on top and Grant calling the shots, Grant realizing that Longstreet could be an enormously important figure for him and his own reconstruction efforts um, was demonstrated uh, true. Longstreet even saw that in a letter he wrote to John Dent. Longstreet excuse me, pointed out that, that um, even as, even as early as 1868, Grant's qualities as a, a, a person who was going to restore the, the Union, restore the wealth of the South, and restore um, harmony, and that this was a key reason why Grant should be considered as a natural man to be the natural candidate to win the presidency. So even as early as 1868, Longstreet is, is essentially campaigning in the South for an acceptance of, of Grant. And of course, this deepens as Grant uh, wins the presidency. Longstreet's problems as a recognized Southern leader um, begin to uh, accelerate because Longstreet has taken the position in New Orleans, a city by that time that had been over five years under occupation of federal troops. Um, people forget that, Long that New Orleans fell in 1862 well before, before Vicksburg. But here you have a case where, where Longstreet's in New Orleans and he's arguing that um, the, uh, you know, the verdict of the battlefield should be accepted and that the South should, should work with the victors to try to get um, the, back into the Union. And that is not a popular position. And um, it becomes increasingly unpopular as the media keep asking Longstreet to clarify his views in printed letters, one of which is Uncle Augustus Longstreet says when reading the draft, if you print this letter, it'll ruin you. And of course, old Pete, we call him old Pete because his nickname was old Pete back at the point, just like Grant's was Sam. Um, Longstreet goes ahead and prints the letter, publishes the letter in the New Orleans papers in 1867, and it does create for him um, serious political issues and problems that um, Grant tries in the course of his own presidency and reconstruction policy to rehabilitate with mar marginal success. He gives Grant, for example, Grant gives Longstreet the very first political appointment in his administration, um, a very important post as the surveyor of the customs and port of New Orleans, um, one of the most lucrative posts in the federal um, plum book in those days. Mm -hmm. But um, the fact that, that uh, Grant becomes uh, his patron really and Longstreet becomes Grant's eyes and ears in Reconstruction New Orleans um, 
plays out a very uh, interesting story that I think people have yet to really look at. We've looked at it. We're interested in telling it. Well, to wrap this up, what lessons do you think can be drawn from the study of relationships between historical giants such as Longstreet and Grant? Well, that's a difficult question. I think the, I think the, uh, the, the, the first, um, the base on which you have to operate is that there's a lot more to um, history than, than just written reports and newspaper articles and even books and article magazines of articles of, of the uh, of personages that are living at the time. There's, there's the relationships that they have, and those are the hardest to, to sort out with letters and with, with other inter, intersections. But um, the fact that Grant and Longstreet were able to uh, fashion over the years these, this, uh, this bond um, maybe it started with their love of horses. Who knows? Maybe it started with just the fact that one was a was a, a prankster, played a lot of games, finished third lowest in his class, and the other Grant was a mathematics uh, kind of a um, taciturn, very uh, serious um, guy. I mean, the fact that they were able to to put this together and uh, stay friends and transcend so much. I mean, Grant uh, owed Longstreet met much in the early days. There are various intersections as they're young officers. And when Grant leaves the army, who takes up a collection among his old friends to help him transition into civilian life, finding out that he's in trouble through the letters the wives are exchanging, I suspect. Um, who helps him? Well, it's Longstreet. Um, who does Grant take um, to um, to a courthouse in, in St. Louis in the late 1850s? Um, to announce that he's going to give a single male slave that he owns freedom. Just sign away the, the, this, a, a very important financial statement as Grant is financially terribly strapped. Who does he take to the courthouse with him, uh, literally grabbing him off the street when he meets him to witness this, this, um, this, give, this, this, um, this act? It is Longstreet. Um, Longstreet and Grant are, uh, are important because, and their friendship is important because it, it uh, gives you an interesting reflection when you look at their friendship through the prism of these different stages of history, all the way out to Grant's death and his courage. It gives you a, a way of looking at a period of, of our history that's not often um, given what I call the context of history, going into and coming out of the Civil War. We spend so much time in the sesquicentennial, looking at battles and, and, and different personalities. We don't look at, at contexts and we don't look at, at uh, this kind of thing very often because it's hard to see. That's why I call them silent men of destiny, really, or, or friends between the lines. It's almost like they didn't want it known just how close they were. But there's little doubt when you look at the record that their friendship was a, a very important part of our history and something that I think gives it at, at a sesquicentennial moment everybody a chance to reflect on how important friendship and relationships really are. And I don't know in our day and time that people would spend enough time worrying about that. They're so busy with their uh, cloistered internet lives and online screens to, to uh, focus on the, the, uh, the importance of those people that are in their immediate friendship circles. But I think Grant and Longstreet provide an extraordinarily important uh, um, window on that and therefore, and the honor and the loyalty to which, um, for example, Longstreet took after Grant passed away to all the reunions that he was constantly invited to, to present uh, the view of, of uh, he, he said something very important that I want to read if I can. Um, at, at one reunion in 1883 in Chicago, there you have Longstreet uh, on a stage um, and he's being wildly cheered by Union veterans and, and um, he's telling them what they want to hear about Grant. But he says, those who are forgiven most love the most. And a crowd roared more. What, what Longstreet was saying was he had, he had been forgiven but he also loved the country and he loved the union the most. 
the fact that they worked together in tandem um, all the years after the war to sew back the threads of unity through their own friendship uh, has not been dissected and needs to be looked at, I think, in this sesquicentennial period because it's a great inspirational as to what, what can be uh, achieved through the maintenance of uh, a friendship. So I, you know, I only offer that as, as a, uh, because I've, I've done some work on writing an article about this. Um, and the more I, I see, the more intersections I visit with the respect to their lives, the more I realize that this was the real deal. Thank you, Nick, for sharing your thoughts about Grant and Longstreet this morning. Thank you.